Well, greetings, everybody. I'm Ann Harrigan, music director of the Billings Symphony, and I'm here to welcome you to Concert Cues. Today, we're talking about Beethoven, specifically Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, with three of our esteemed guest artists, Jason Vest, tenor, Christy Hageman, Conover, soprano, and Victoria Vargas, alto. Welcome, and uh, so exciting because uh, as we work in the music field, oftentimes we communicate for years. In fact, we had talked about doing this for a year and a half, I believe, and here we are, uh, but uh, Victoria and Jason, we met 10 minutes ago, so yeah. yes. welcome to Montana. It's Thank so exciting you. to have you here, We're sharing some stories in common. Christy, of course, is a native of Billings, well known and beloved, but you are also connected to these artists, so it's very exciting. We are missing Darren Small because he's teaching at MSUB and preparing his chorus, the MSUB Chorale, which will be singing with us in the symphony. So he's, he's got his work cut out for him and he's doing great things. So Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, the first ever symphony that was written with a chorus and with vocal soloists. He started it 200 years ago. And it was uh, two years from now will be the 200th uh, birthday of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. And here we are still doing it. This is the third time that the Billings Symphony has performed the work. Uh, but it's a very unique work for soloists. What is it like? I'm going to ask each of you. You have extremely different roles. Even though we have a quartet, we have a soprano, an alto, a tenor, and a bass baritone. Uh, but oftentimes there's solos, there's duets. Talk a little bit about your role, your part. Uh, what does it feel like? Does it feel like operatic to you? Um, anything you have to mind, tell me about it. Jason. Oh, great. Well, you know, <laughs> uh, singing Beethoven Ninth is, is really different for me than almost anything else um, because you, are, you do come out of a full symphony. Uh, and of course, uh, the, the way Beethoven wrote this was revolutionary for his time. I think I like to say that Beethoven is, is a punk rock for his time. I you love know. it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he took the boundaries of everything that was done and stretched them and adding these singers into that, of course, was, was uh, pretty punk for that time. Um, but he, uh, yeah, as a singer, um, I, I come out of everything the orchestra has been doing and um, what I do is so varied, so you know it starts with a, a sort of a chorus part with all four of us, and then uh, and then I sing this sort of Turkish march, yeah. lead the lead this chorus of men along on this Turkish march, which is so strange and unique, um, but you know, um, reemphasizing that happiness and unity and brotherhood. So yeah, it's it's unique to anything else. I sort of think of it like a little bit of a Beethovenian drinking song. Oh, you know? yeah. Yeah, and Schiller, the poem, came from a drinking song, and Beethoven sort of took those parts out, too. Oh, no, I didn't know that, yeah. see? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, well, when you sing, uh, your, your backup band, uh, so to speak, is the men's chorus. Yeah. And yeah. so that's where I really, you know, lauf it, bruder, you know, let's laugh together. And, uh, mm -hmm. of course, we translate bruder and uh, mention to be all people today, but it's the same kind of concept. Uh, and it's interesting because this was then turned into a hymn, the Ode to Joy, uh, but it does talk about friends and brotherhood, and um, it's a wonderful thing for these times, great focus on unity, and everybody come together, you know, um, what the world tries to divide, you know, is brought together by joy, and I love that line, that's one of Darren's lines. So Christy, uh, you're uh, an unusual part the last time you sang with us, we did Carmen together. We did. We did. Uh, yes. You were uh, with... Uh, <laughs> I was pregnant. You were pregnant. With my first child, <laughs> yes. I was a pregnant Micaela, which was a little... I mean, we didn't weave it into the storyline, but <laughs> not that time. Um, it was also just a joy always to sing with the symphony. Um, love coming back. But it's funny how we... Um, you know, it's, a, it's not a huge soprano character role in in the role of um, in the opera of Carmen and here too it's not it's not a huge solo but it's still very it's it's a, a feat because it the tessitura of it's so difficult a lot of it is above the staff it's um, very high lots of high notes and um, I was thinking about you know when I was in high school I would listen to it a lot but I always thought if I ever had those high notes, I would love to sing this this piece. And now that I do, and now I get to sing it, it's a bucket list item for sure. Oh, that's exciting. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because the soprano never has a solo. 
in this particular piece, but is always supported in a duet or a quartet, but it floats above. And you mentioned mm -hmm. the word tessitura. I'm not sure if everybody knows what that yes. means. And maybe you could talk about that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, tessitura is the kind of the area that it sits, um, that most of the notes are, are located in. A lower tessitura means that I'm gonna sing mostly in, in this lower range of my voice. Or in a medium tessitura, it's more of a, a comfortable, not high, not low, very comfortable. But this is a high tessitura, so it's it, I'm constantly <laughs> singing in in an uncomfortable part of my voice, <laughs> one might say. And it's interesting to look at the preparation. Beethoven is, I would say, more of a cerebral. Um, he, he is a, a composer that everything was just, it, it made sense lo logically to him. Whereas Mozart, it was more of a, a he could feel it and he knew singers and voices so well that singing Mozart is really easy mm -hmm. because it it's natural whereas Beethoven is like okay now <laughs> survive. It's more similar to singing Bach, Beethoven is. Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. yes. Well it's in interesting that you say that because uh, we're actually going to be performing a couple works of Bach uh, in honor of Eloise Kirk who was a musical mother of our community, yeah. founding member of the Billing Symphony. And these pieces were pieces that she loved. But now that they're on the program, I feel that there's a great similarity between the Bach Orchestral Suite Number no. 3 and Beethoven's writing. So yeah. it's interesting that you say that yes. about singing it as well. Mm -hmm. And we, we're going to come back to that and talk a little bit about what it's going to be like for the chorus oh. to sing. Because I know you make everything you do sound easy. <laughs> Easy, easy, easy. So. Well, thank you. It's not always that way. <laughs> <laughs> so, Victoria, your role is uh, well known among singers. It's, it's famous for the depth of it, and it's actually very, very important, even though, again, you don't have a solo. Uh, but what are the parts of it that excite you the most, and what are the parts of the text that speak to you? Sure. So I think that one of the reasons it's an infamous role, if we're going to use that word, is that it's, it is the theme. It's the first time we hear that Ode to Joy theme that everyone is so familiar with. Uh, I think one of the challenges of the role in something like this is that it's, it's layered on like the rest of the symphony. So at first you hear just a trio of the tenor, the mezzo, and, and the baritone, and then we, we go on and we add more voices. So it's that fine line between having your solo line and making sure everyone's hearing that you know, the very first time we hear that theme, but also not standing out, right? So it's kind of a challenge of it. And I think one of the things that, that I love about the piece in general at this particular time is that with all that's been going on with COVID and being able to make music together and to celebrate that music making at all levels, there's text about the worm up to the cherub speaking to God. I mean, just sort of that, that the imagery of that is really special and, and super cool to think about. So I, I think it's just, for me, it's not vocally taxing. I will say that. So <laughs> if I sound vocally taxed, I'm not doing it right. But uh, the text is, is super important to just to really give that imagery of brotherhood and coming together and uplifting each other. I think that that is the role that the mezzo part plays in the quartet. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, I know that Beethoven really had his eyes on this text for many, many years, I think since the 1880s, and he kept coming up with ideas and then going away from it and going towards it and away from it until he finally started on it. I said it's 1822, uh, he, and then 1824 he premiered it. But I think it is the text, and it's interesting that it starts out, the last movement starts out with a controlled chaos. And it's an interesting challenge because you want it to sound bad, but you don't want it to sound bad. You know what I mean? And one of the things, uh, not related to what you're doing, but it is, is the way that, I think you said it, the way he develops it, he kind of back develops it, right? So it starts out with this written out chaos, literally. And then you think you'll have the famous baritone solo, but you don't. He writes a recitative, which is an uh, improvisatory style of solo for the cellos and the basses. Now you imagine at this time during the cellos and the basses, uh, they were typically used to doing uh, continual playing, you know, the bass line, uh, improvising on chords in box time certainly, or umpa band, right? So this is something really unusual and we've got a fantastic cello section. But as you said, they start with that and then they go back to the chaos and the bass baritone sings um, 
O Freunde nicht die Tönen. Uh, and my German is so much worse than yours. <laughs> That's why they let me conduct. <laughs> but, uh, oh, friends, not these tones, no more chaos. And it's just the perfect thing, even though it's got its, its challenges, but to have the band back together again. You know what I mean? We haven't had the chorale with us for two years. It's the first time the chorale will be on stage in this lovely renovated hall. And we have three groups with us. We've got our Billings Symphony Chorale, we've got the Montana State University Chorus, and we have the Rock, Rocky Mountain Chorale under the direction of Stephen Hart. I already mentioned Montana State University under Darren Small, who is also singing the bass baritone part. So now all of you are educators, and all of you have probably sung this in a chorus at some time. Uh, and it is notorious. It's a great challenge because it's such a seminal piece the words are so moving, and you have to make it sound easy. But as you said, I mean, if it's high for you, you know, it's those high A's and above, right? And, and the tenors as well, right? Scream, scream, scream. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so we're really lucky to have Dr. Stephen Hart and Darren Small here who have been working with the choruses for a year to prepare this. Yeah, they started in September. And they've got it. They're already, you know, halfway through here and going on to Messiah now, which is this is the next thing. But you're all teachers, and so you, I, I already heard you guys talking. You've got your teacher hats, your performing hats. You know, tell us a little bit about your life when you're not performing, your teaching life, and how Beethoven impacts you in that way. Victoria. The oh, interesting. Do you mean this piece uh, specifically, or is any it? Beethoven? Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, I think. For me, what's been interesting about this piece is, is I often perform a lot of operatic work. So, you know, Beethoven, I know him through the lens of Fidelio mostly and some of his art song. I actually did some Beethoven art song um, last fall, which were really beautiful. Some Irish folk songs that were reimagined, which was really kind of cool. But uh, what's so interesting about this is getting in the mind of being part of the larger symphonic work rather than just focusing on being a soloist. I think that is something very unique to this piece. When I was coaching it uh, back in Minneapolis, I said to my coach, like, where am I supposed to breathe? Where does that happen in this? I don't understand. <laughs> you know, and so you hear these famous recordings and, and you, it's interesting to see the choices that people make depending on the texture of where they would like the breathing to happen so that we can get a certain color or maybe delay a certain effect to the Flugelwald that we sing at the very end. It's so many different choices and options that people choose for the color of that to the very last text that we sing together. Uh, so that's been, that's been an interesting aspect about this particular piece and working on Beethoven is, is not thinking necessarily soloistically, but more in the grand picture. How does this fit in? Yeah. So Victoria, you said something that really struck me. You said you're coaching. And when you first said I thought you thought you were coaching somebody else, but you had somebody coach you. You are a professional, you're a professional opera singer, you're a teacher, and yet as an adult, you went to somebody else for coaching? Always. That's fantastic. I always do. I always say, is this, did I do it right? No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I tell my students all the time, you can't have any, you don't have any idea what you sound like. You know, you, you have an idea, of course, but We've all had that effect. Your audience will have that thing where you hear your voicemail and you go, is that me? Is that my voice? I didn't think I sounded like that. And so I, I think anytime I'm preparing a work, I always want to get feedback from a colleague. Um, Jason and I were just talking about Bach. I'm doing my first Bach Mass in B minor in a couple of weeks and coaching that as well. And it's just, I think it's just so important to get that feedback and have that conversation. No, I think that's fascinating. I and mean, we talk about lifelong learning, such an example of that. Yeah, so. I was just going to say that. I think that's an important thing. Um, I often hear as a singer, oh, you're so talented. You know, you must have been born with this talent. And, and, and yes, I was raised in a musical family. And so some of that was in my ears, in my brain. But um, one of the early lessons that I had with a really influential teacher, she said, uh, you will never be perfect as a singer. And you will never sing a perfect performance. And you will never stop working for that perfection the rest of your life. Um, this is not uh, something that we can just sort of lay back and rely on our talent. Uh, it is something that we have to continually work for. And it's really important that we surround ourselves with people that we trust, with the, the ears that we know are, are sensitive um, and understand our voice in particular. So I'm, 
I'm actually not an educator, but I do work at a university in an academic setting. I work more on the admin side, but I'm surrounded by amazing musicians, coaches, um, conductors, and even this week, I grabbed the maestro who just came off of the opera production and said, hey, he's, he's British and, um, from, and studied in Europe, and say, could I, could I get a coaching on this Beethoven? And he had beautiful insight. Mm -hmm. On, on vocally how to approach it, on um, breaths. Oh my gosh, where, where do we breathe? <laughs> but also the, the, the historical background of it and everything. So you always, you always do your research, whether it's by yourself or with, your, with other people and other professionals. Oh, that's fascinating. You know, Chrissy, I saw something in your bio though about talking about teaching uh, people to being a good human. Oh my goodness. Oh, yeah. Um, that really spoke to me. Yeah, uh, my I've been very blessed to have music educators from from singing in the church choir as you know even before getting into school uh, with Cheryl Pidak actually she was my um, my children's choir director and all through middle school high school college and even now it's you're teaching music and you're teaching all of the academic things but you're also teaching in that age range, even even as an adult, about humanity and how how you work together and what the text means and, and what does it mean in these circumstances right now and historically what did it mean and, and that informs us to be better humans. Well said. And, uh, well, is there anything else you'd like to add about your thoughts about this piece or insight for our future young singers who will be listening to us? I, I would just add that this is uh, timely. Um, the message of this, uh, this work, I mean, it's never not timely. It was timely in Beethoven's time as well. Uh, but just considering the discord around the world, the, the war in Ukraine, um, the um, racial disharmony that we've had, um, all of these cultural things that we're trying to reconcile ourselves with, Beethoven too was struggling with all of that. And, and tried to bring us this message. Uh, I mean, his whole life, he was, he was struggling not just for belonging personally, which you see him trying to tie himself to various causes, but he also was struggling for this, this harmony of all humans um, that we sing about in this. It's well said. Christy? Um, I think just closing thoughts of, I, I hope that singers even you know looking back to when i was young to think one day one day i might be able to sing that is that yes you can it's absolutely possible it doesn't mean that you if you don't have the notes now that you won't later with the right guidance and the right you know maturing of the voice and becoming an adult but um, to find inspiration of you can you have we are role models and you're as a human you are you take um guidance and you take your motivation and your and what you know that you believe in and and you can achieve. Beautiful, Victoria. Well, they already said what I was going to say. Oh say. no, <laughs> no. Uh, I guess just to piggyback on that, I think it really comes back to the the message is to just break barriers and and find the commonality, whether that be a student and working on translations so that they can feel the humanity, or as a performer conveying the text so that the audience feels the humanity. I think that is. The goal of everything that we do is to just share the, the human experience together. Well, I'm so excited. I can't wait for us to begin rehearsals and come together and share all of your wonderful humanity <laughs> uh, with the orchestra, with the chorale, and with our audiences and really create these connections that we all crave so much, uh, even more so now after such a long absence. And so I want to thank you for sharing your thoughts. It's just wonderful talking to you and hearing from you. Again, this has been Concert Cues, and my name is Anne Harrigan. I'm the music director of the Billings Symphony Orchestra and Chorale.